You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. My name is Lisa Webster, volunteer with the Life on Gabriola Media Society, and today we're going to do our third episode on the history of the Gabriola Island peace doves. So today, in two separate interviews, we'll speak with Dar Mace, who was a member of the Gabriola Island Peace Association in the uh, late 80s, um, as well as Howard Stiff and Deb Ferens, who were um, also members of the Gabriola Island Peace Association, and they're going to speak about the origins of both that organization as well as their involvement and the further origins of the Gabriel of Peace Dubs. And I think you'll find it a very entertaining episode um, with lots of ideas um, on how to continue with uh, peace activities and how to promote peace in our day and age, as well as listening to a little bit of the history of Gabriola. Enjoy. I'm here today to interview Dar Mace, a long-term resident of Gabriola, who moved here in 1980 and was part of the original uh, Gabriola Island Peace Association, GIPA, who instigated the Peace Doves and um, is here to tell us a little bit more about how they started and her involvement in, in the, the project. So Dar, I'm going to get you first to just introduce yourself a little bit in the way that you would like to be introduced and begin to tell us your story. Okay, um, my name's Dar Mace, and I moved here in 1980 um, and uh, raised my family. Um, my children were born in 82 and 84, and when they were little, um, I started um, getting more interested in trying to make the world a better place. And this little group, GIPA, the Gabriel Island Peace Association, um, sparked my curiosity and um, they gave me a, an, out, an outlook on the world that I had not um, seen before. And they started connecting a few dots for me between peace, environment, and my community, and the outer world, the outer politics. And I found it very stimulating. Um, the Peace Doves were an initiative that I wasn't really involved in, but a supportive of, um, but, and we Put them all over the community as a universal symbol of peace. Um, pieces, studying peace became a big focus and the people that I met through the group were um, fabulous people, very interesting, um, still friends with lots of them and a lot of them have passed on. Um, I think that's part of what we're here for today is I think remembering and understanding why the doves are all over the island. Um, I didn't know why they were here and I saw so many of them and I was wondering what exactly did they mean and so a conversation started on Facebook and I think that's really it's great to understand the perspectives of you know the people on the island who made mm -hmm. the island and what it is today and as you say um, many of the folks have passed on and I think by um, honoring them in these interviews and really giving people a new perspective on the doves is reigniting that yeah. desire and wish for peace, right? We need symbols. We need more symbols like the doves for um, tolerance of diver diverse opinions in a small community. And, and how it works is that you're never going to get everybody to agree on everything. Um, peace, the idea, we're just very fortunate that we live in a peaceful community. Um, but people have worked on that, you know, local being involved locally um, in the political way, you you get to see how tensions arise over um, silly stuff in the big picture, but it escalates and it becomes bigger stuff. And um, it's a it's an early Christian symbol, the the dove. It's also in the tarot. 
you know, it's um, a symbol of spirit and um, the idea of the, the dove with the branch coming back after the flooding. Um, again, it, it will mean different things to different people and different people will appropriate that symbol. And that's why I'm really happy to see this regeneration of making a symbol that um, is universal for peace. Peace always comes down to peace on whose terms. And we need, you know, we can study that and we can get into the nitty gritty of it. But um, I love this community and I've been here for 44 years now. And um, I like the diversity of characters, you know. Um, and you don't always have to agree with everybody, but if you can put up a sign, a symbol saying that at least, well, let's, let's try. And I always say, well, um, if you, um, you don't go on what other people say about people, you go on your own interaction with them, because otherwise you won't have a friend on Gabriella. <laughs> <laughs> so true. <laughs> so put that dove out there. I'm a big proponent of that. Right on. Now, in the 80s, was there an event or um, an activity that actually um, brought you into the group? I know uh, we had chatted earlier before the interview started about your first meeting. Um, was it that first meeting that got you hooked? or I think it was the people um, and the stimulating conversations and the bringing in of different um, news from different places. And um, then... Um, Jean McLaren was a friend of mine. Uh, we became really good friends through Jeepa, and uh, we started the Raging Grannies here. I was, I was too young to be a bona fide granny, but um, it was it was a way of being politically active and having fun. Um, but with my children small, um, I couldn't um, risk arrest. You know, with daycare issues <laughs> every every um, every day, so the practicalities of that kind of um, you know became too much. So I had to make a decision there. Um, I got involved in Clockwood um, as an arrestee there, and then the whole idea of um, going to jail. Well, that again, raising small children, you have to make these choices, mm -hmm. right? Um, and it doesn't always work. And so it's like I could not do that. So it was like, how can I be more active in my um, community working for something that I believe in? I can't work for everything that I believe in. And so that's how Growls started with a girlfriend. So there was seeds from Jeepa that I have seen grow in this community in wonderful ways, just by realizing that acting locally is probably one of the best things you can do for making positive changes in this world in a peaceful manner. Absolutely. 100% agree with that one. Um, is there anything that you do now um, specifically to support peace and to, you know, carry on the legacies that you've started? A living on Gabriola. I think you do it every day. I think you make a conscious choice every day, whether you're going to um, open your heart to people, open your um, mind to people, um, or just duck and cover, which we have that lovely option because, I mean, we all need to recharge and that's why we live in such a beautiful natural environment. Protecting wildlife ha habitat here is my passion now with through growls. Mm -hmm. And so it seems that peace for you extends to everything, the environment, to our relations who are non-human. And I think that's a great... Yes, yeah, studying G uh, the peace studies through JIPA helped make all those connections. And uh, Howie, Steph, and Deb Farron, Susan Yates, Alan Wilson, um, myself, I'm forgetting somebody probably, we actually got a peace studies course together. At, it was run for one semester up at Malaspina College, which is now VIU. And I know that there's some younger people. Um, Jamie, the fellow who did my woodshed, he's really interested in studying the concept of peace and how, you know, peace on whose terms how do you create peace at the daily level, the you know microcosm, macrocosm? Mm -hmm, that's yeah. Wonderful. Is, has that course continued at all, or is no, there... it hasn't. Oh, that's, but, that's a hey, shame. If the, if the doves are coming back, maybe the peace studies can come back too. Absolutely, I think there's a real desire right now for people to learn how to communicate. We, you know, yeah. we, we fight every day on social media, 
and we don't we don't actually know how to get along on social media most of the time because we're using that as a way to vent and anger and so i think it would be an absolutely yeah. wonderful thing and definitely necessary yeah. i think so too yeah is there anything else that you would like to say about jipa and your experience um well um i would like to encourage people to, i know it's really hard to um uh, you know, have the time. Time seems to be such a, a, a critical thing for us, but I mean, just one little thing and in getting involved in your community um, in, in a way that brings you joy, I think will, will help. Um, and social media, well, there's a process to it too. It's not all bad. There's not all bad to anything, right? Even Taylor Swift, right? You, you can like her. <laughs> <laughs> You like her, you hate her, you gotta respect her. Yeah, like we can be respectful, right? <laughs> so that's that's I don't know what else. I mean, there's a lot. It could go on and on and on. We could we could write a course about it, right? And write a few books. But um, thank you for taking the interest, and I'm happy to uh, contribute in whatever little way. Right on. So thank you very much for your time today. And I am, will make sure we give you a copy. And um, yeah. Oh, they don't want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. Hello and welcome. I am Lisa Webster, a volunteer with the Life on Gabriella Media Society. And we're here today to interview Howie Stiff and Deb Ferens, who are um, part of the original Gabriel Island Peace Association, um, um, founders, inception, movement, beginners, and uh, the very first wave of the Peace Doves and the Peace Dove story came from the work of this association. So I'm gonna start with you, Howie. Why don't you introduce yourself the way you'd like to be introduced? And when you're done, we'll uh, flip over and we'll um, have Deb introduce herself. Thank you, Lisa. So my name's Howard, or Howie Stiff, and uh, I've been on Gabriel Lift since about 1985. I am a salmon biologist and moved essentially to the island to um, to take a job with the Pacific Biological Station in Nanaimo. And I thought, Gabriola looks like a smarter place to live than downtown Nanaimo at the time. And so I ended up here uh, in 1985 and I started to meet these wonderful peace activists. And uh, yeah, kind of rolled with that for, for many years. Right on. And Deb, what about yourself? How would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, Deborah Ferens, and um, I've been on Gabriola since 1982, and previous to that, uh, Courtney, BC, and for four years, and previous to that, I'm a prairie girl, so from, the, from Manitoba. Um, uh, we came here for work, raised my family here, two children, Jen and Justin, and my, and I think, um, GIPA was the very first organization in an activist way I ever joined oh, in my whole life. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. That was the very first organization. What, yes. what about for you, Howie? Was it your first hmm. um, <clears throat> peace activism? I was involved in at least attending a lot of the peace marches. You know, back in the day, 1980s, middle of the 80s, uh, we had conservative governments in power in the U.S. and Canada, and maybe in the Britain. Thatcher was she mm -hmm. then, mm -hmm. and um, <clears throat> you know there was. Uh, I remember 1986 being like a year of year of the year of peace, mm -hmm. international year of peace. It was declared, and uh, so I had attended several <clears throat> Vancouver-based peace marches, which were huge. They were. You know, some of them got up to 80,000 people oh, wow. uh, marching down, you know, Granville Street or something. I can't remember over the broad bridges and stuff like that. It was pretty amazing. And it, um, <clears throat> so I was aware that there was like a lot of, um, you know, the issues were kind of roiling around like, you know, nuclear proliferation around the world. Uh, someone estimated 50,000 different warheads mm -hmm. on the planet. 
like 6,000 times more explosive power than all of World War II, including the bombs dropped mm -hmm. on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> um, so the proliferation was an issue. The U.S. was kind of promoting a kind of warlike stance with usual, as usual with Russia. Um, <clears throat> Ronald Reagan was in power. Star Wars were on his, remember Star Wars? That was a strategic mm -hmm. defense initiative, which was a, <clears throat> a <clears throat> kind of missile-based system that was going to destabilize the, the kind of precarious uh, peace that was going on, you know, under the mutual assured destruction approach that had been so far based on deterrence. Um, so here is Ronald Reagan pushing for a new thing, new way of uh, weaponizing the situation. There was uh, cruise missile testing. There's all these things. <clears throat> and here on the West Coast, of course, there was this kind of semi uh, secretive uh, testing of anti submarine uh, warfare methods at CF Meter, which none of us knew about. <clears throat> now, what is CF Meter? It's, it's, um... So, CF Meter stands for Canadian Forces Maritime Experimental Test Range. <clears throat> and it is basically a uh, military base, uh, ostensibly under Canadian you know, Department of National Defense management, but staffed, of course, by U.S. and Canadian uh, military and civilians. But it's really equipped by the United States and hot linked to various naval ports in Washington and basically driven by U.S. military interests in anti-nuclear <clears throat> I should say anti-submarine warfare. Um, and of course, uh, so the base itself is in is in the Noose Bay, right? It's uh, just north of Nanaimo. It's okay. uh, there's a uh, kind of military you know uh, base where you know highly sophisticated electronic equipment is stationed, and um, they manage the Whiskey Gulf Range in the Strait of Georgia, which is a kind of large um, geographical area basically uh, uh, equipped with sono boys and basically sonar equipment to to evaluate the um, sonic footprint of submarines and torpedoes mainly mm -hmm. there's other tests that are done there too but um, so uh, that's the base it's kind of run from the United States uh, <clears throat> the big issue as far as the, the noose peace campers was, is that there's these nuclear vessels kind of put, coming up and, and landing at the port and doing their tests in this, in this uh, Whiskey Gulf range. And um, some of them were nuclear submarines, which uh, of course are floating reactors, nuclear reactors, and uh, with mm -hmm. risks that we weren't really paying, or at least the authorities didn't seem to be caring too much about. Um, Accidents do happen. Research was showing that there was uh, kind of accidents with these vessels that were more frequent than, than uh, were, were terribly frequent. <clears throat> um, nothing major, but uh, always a few accidents per year. Right. The risk is always there, so, for sure. Now, you mentioned the Nanaimo Peace Campers. So who are they? Were you one? Were you one as well, Dan? No, I wasn't. So were you? Well, no. I didn't actually camp on the site, but no. there was a... <clears throat> the Peace Campers were essentially set up a... Uh, what would you call it? A, a public awareness mm -hmm. booth with a beautiful old truck labeled with all kinds of... Um, mm -hmm. Logos and signs like that. and... And they, Posters. they occupied the uh, rest area mm -hmm. at Nanooks. Okay. You could probably pass. And they were just set up there for the day. And there was also, there was also a teepee. Yep, there was a, a piece of And teepee. was it set up in the, uh, in the rest area too? It was very close to that area. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so those were the you know, original peace campers. And they would you know, kind of advertise when a submarine was in port. And uh, make sure that motorists knew about it and you know, just passers-by. And um, eventually, there was the Nanus Peace House. So um, um, a donor uh, purchased a home right on, uh, on the bay across from CF Meter, and it was n known as the Nanus Peace House. And there, uh, there was many activities there, and it was like a witness 
mm. a permanent witness. And so this will be a year or two after the the TP and the and the truck and and that sort of early activity. And what they were witnessing was the, the arrival of these vessels mm -hmm. and then notifying the networks, right? So they'd have uh, binoculars trained on the site and when a, when a nuclear vessel came in, which back in, like I said, in the 1980s was pretty frequent. There was maybe 40, 50 vessel visits a year, either at the Noose or Vancouver even, apparently, where, um, you know, a floating nuclear reactor with perhaps nuclear weapons on board, the U.S. government made a point of neither confirming nor denying mm -hmm. that they were actually carrying any nuclear weapons, but, you know, military analysts were saying, uh, look, if it's a nuclear-capable vessel, that means it's nuclear-equipped. So right. that is, you know, what the Peace Campers were all about, really, is this risk of, uh, not to mention just being complicit in the um, arms race, really, with testing this kind of anti-submarine warfare mechanisms or, me you know, weapons, whereby analysts also say the gave the USA a first strike capability because if you can quietly eliminate the submarines of the of you know Russian submarines then you're knocking out their ability to strike back uh, so that kind of uh, again destabilized mm -hmm. what little uh, kind of peace you know level of uh, uh, agreement there was under the so-called no first strike policy which was okay. an earlier policy that either side would use their nuclear weapons first, um, kind of a handshake thing. Um, so this was destabilizing that. Of course, Star Wars was on also in there too as a, mm -hmm. another destabilizing feature. So there's a number of things, but I think the, the recognition that Canada was complicit in a bunch of things, cruise tip missile testing in the North over the objections of indigenous and local people there, uh, mm -hmm. the whole Star Wars thing, the way Canadian businesses were tied into all the uh, development of, missile, of weaponry in the U.S. and its allies. Um, uh, that that you know, basically taxpayers were were um, what's the word uh, invest? We were we were subsidizing mm, subsidizing war is essentially what it yeah. sounds like. And Canada was part of this arms race. Exactly, exactly. Fueled by our dollars, tax dollars. So it was. Uh, so your response then here on Gabriola, um, seeing what was going on in, in the news and, and the news peacekeepers, it, peace camp, sorry, is that kind of how, what brought the JIPA into existence? Or is there a, another moment where it was like, yeah, we need to do something in an organized way? Well, I think it was definitely connected to the news. And at the same time, there was a worldwide movement, an anti-nuclear movement really growing strongly during the Cold War, which was really intensifying during the late 70s and early 80s. And so there was a number of people on Gabriola who, who were also um, bringing to the uh, origins of JIPA just that global anti-nuclear movement bringing it locally to Gabriola and then having something like uh, uh, the CF meter and the attention there that was in our backyard. So it was easy to to connect activism locally and globally, the, the two at the same time. So my I, I didn't I was not one of the founders in the very first days. So that it might have started in 83. 82, 83, and I joined in 1984, and my daughter was just born, so she's a brand new baby, and I, I do remember, just like many at the time, um, it just seemed so pervasive, the, the, the scariness, the dangers of the Cold War, and how prolific nuclear weapons were, and just the buildup of that tension around the world. So um, there was certainly a lot of anti-nuclear sentiment and the need to respond to that at both the local and global level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me it was a matter of like trying to get educated myself and then realizing this is going, you know, as you get educated, you realize, okay, we have to, it would be helpful to educate others. And I think that's where mm -hmm. the networking that you were talking about with other groups, uh, FIND, um, well, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. So, so VIND is the Vancouver Island Network for Disarmament. So there were peace groups all up and down Vancouver Island. Oh, wow. Right, Victoria right through to Port Hardy. Uh, and we would meet quarterly as uh, a, a disarmament uh, groups um, and, and just share tactics and stories and um, what each group was doing. We produced a newsletter on a, a quarterly basis so that it shared all the information that each group was doing. Um, so that was a that was a fairly significant part of our work was not um, only on as how, how he was saying about uh, you know educating ourselves and acting locally but just sort of spreading it out and sharing all our stories and um, and ways and, and of course everybody um, brought new things to it because you each quarterly meeting somebody would say well why don't we try this why don't we do this and we go yeah that sounds like a great idea so lots of lots of coordination and and um, activities amongst all the groups right on okay. and one of the big things that came out of that and I'm also I was not a founder of Jeep I came on in 1986 just after probably one of the most uh, amazing uh, symposia um, on peace in Canada was took place in in Nanaimo, and that was called the People's Inquiry into CF Meter, and Chipa and NCC activists as well as the other networks uh, basically assembled this uh, two-day kind of well, symposium. Mm -hmm. Different speakers, medical doctors on the you know the dangers of radiation, mm -hmm. uh, military analysts. Uh, <clears throat> Um, they could not get CF Meter to show up. That's mm. another story. <laughs> Ironically, uh, right? They could not get the Nanaimo <laughs> mayor or any of his council to show up. Right. But uh, other councillors <laughs> from Parksville and other places mm -hmm. were, were there and uh, supportive. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, it was really that symposium which brought CF Meter into the at least the provincial, if not national, awareness. Uh, and um, I mentioned earlier that I was a salmon biologist and at the time there was these salmon wars going on and, and CF Meter kind of crept up in, the, in public awareness and Glenn Clark who was the premier at the time, you know, this is 10 years into the salmon wars and things aren't going very well and Glenn Clark, uh, he plays this card and he says, we're going to actually uh, revoke the license to use the uh, the new space, or at least the substrate upon which the waters of Whiskey Gulf sit, which BC has jurisdiction over, not the water itself, right? <laughs> but the, the ground or anything, we'll revoke the license to that, and that might just shut down uh, the CF Meter uh, facility, which we will do if USA does not come to some agreement about the, the, the salmon wars, um, which all had to do with kind of fishermen overfishing the salmon populations on both sides of the border. Right. Uh, and it was very messy, and we'll go to that, but it was a... Uh, so it reached that level. You were, I mean, so the uh, Krejcian was in power as, a, as the Prime Minister of Canada at the time. He stepped in a few months later to actually expropriate the land. Oh, wow. And tell the U.S. that no, we're good with this uh, CF oh. meter going on. Not so much uh, worried about the salmon, though. You know, we're we're, we're going to put militarization over salmon, you know, kind of stabilization and conservation at this point, which right. is kind of striking. Uh, well, I mean, you know, Canada is a peacekeeper as well. I mean, really, let's dig a little deeper there. You know, and that's that's the work of what the peace organizations were doing was really, really, as you say, raising awareness, education. Mm -hmm. Um, were there any specific activities here on Gabriola that you did? I know we're here talking about the peace stuffs, but what yes. else were some of the things that the Jeepa got up to? Well, and I do want to just pick up on your uh, remark about uh, uh, the, I, the, the concept of peace. Uh, I think as well as being anti-nuclear and taking that kind of political action, there was a, a whole movement to... to well, what does peace mean? How, you know, what would peace look like in the world? What are the things you have to do? How do we become peaceful people and a peaceful society? So that also played a big role in some of Jeepa's background. And I would say some of the things we did here on the island were, were of course, the uh, the the the, the uh, peace the peace doves. 
which this is one of the originals, and it says Gabriel Island is a nuclear weapons-free zone, July 27th, 1984. And that's because the Nanaimo City Council made that declaration um, on that day uh, around Nanaimo becoming a nuclear weapons-free zone. And um, So some of the other things we did on Gabriola, we, we all participated in going down to Victoria on marches. So sometimes we'd have a great big convoy heading down there and join uh, peace marches in Victoria. And um, we, we did for one winter, 87 to 88, actually have a community education course at Mount Spina College, which is how it was known at the time. And it was all around peace and um, disarmament and nuclear issues. So we, we had several of us um, uh, providing instruction and, and giving some of the presentations and it was advertised through Mount Spina College. We, we used to do book reports on any kind of nuclear and peace um, information that was out there and publicize it in some way, which is, I cannot remember how we did that, but we obviously <laughs> wrote up a lot of book reports and, and shared them. Um, we did have, we used to do presentations, like, so we would bring in speakers from various places and have the, you know, have an evening presentation and a talk. And um, I do remember how he reminded me of this, which was a SAGE group. What was, what did SAGE start, stand for again? Students Against, Against Global Extermination. That's what it was. Ah, yes. okay. That's kind of a youth-oriented thing, yeah. and we... We actually organized a second symposium around mm -hmm. those folks coming to Mount Spina yeah. University. And uh, I would say one of the other really uh, worthwhile things was, was Alan Wilson's article, mm -hmm. you know, a weekly column in the, in the newspaper in the Nanaimo called the Nanaimo Times. It was called On the Peace Front. And that really chronicles the kind of development of the, of the, uh, uh, the movement around, you know, getting CF meter out, but also talking about peace and what, you know, the, the trouble was that peace was be, was kind of seen as a political issue. Mm -hmm. Like you're either for peace, you're lefty, you know, kind of a fringe person, or you're uh, for the militarization and the defense of Canada and, and so on. We're, you know, we have to test these submarines because, uh, <clears throat> you know, we have to be strong or the Russians will move in. This was kind of the... But uh, he really did, I think, excellent analyses uh, around, you know, uh, the concept that, as Deborah was saying, peace uh, is a, why is it even considered a political issue? Why is it called fringe in the sense that we all want peace? If you, know, if you ask anybody on either side what they're looking mm -hmm. for, they're both interested in peace. So it really comes down to a, to a sense of what's the best way to keep the peace. Mm -hmm. And if you're interested in anti-submarine warfare and, and cruise missiles and, and strategic defense initiatives, then you think, you know, there's peace through armaments. I think we can honestly say that has, you know, there's very little evidence that it has worked. Um, the, the peace through disarmament, let's give peace a chance. Remember singing, that's, John Lennon was always a feature at every peace walk, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, that uh, approach is less, uh, you know, it's not the path most taken, right? And so yeah. um, certainly coming to terms with the, the need to, where does peace even start? Well, it kind of starts within our, each of us, right? You can't even actually have a peaceful conversation. If you can have a peaceful conversation with your neighbor, mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult to get it together on the national level and so on and so forth. So there was a real dive into that, a look at... Uh, you know, how to bring these two apparent sides together, like move it out of the political realm, move it into uh, a values mm -hmm. uh, discussion mm -hmm. that surely peace lovers on all sides, whether mm -hmm. you're warlike or dove-like, um, can relate to. And yeah, and adding to that, um, I think it was my first encounter with a real, um, um, focused and concentrated uh, look at what does nonviolence mean? Like how do you live a nonviolence mm -hmm. life at a political level and at a at a personal level? And we certainly had some folks that 
were in the early days of GPA that had that very strong focus on like learning about nonviolence, how do you use it politically, how do you use nonviolence resistance around the world, and and it was certainly my first encounter that nonviolent resistance can work, like it has changed um, situations in various um, places around the world, and so it 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 that was a big learning experience for me to learn about um, that as a way to approach um, conflict, mm -hmm. whether it's yeah personal or political. It sounds that from um, chatting with both of you, I think one of the values of having our conversation today is that you're refreshing ideas for folks who are uh, watching or listening or you know um, sharing this uh, uh, interview are these ideas of what you can do mm -hmm. right now uh, in these turbulent times. Yes. So education of yourself, of others, mm -hmm. nonviolent communication, how to learn. Um, certainly, I think, um, Howie, you were saying that even the articles that you mentioned, you could make available through the library for folks, again, mm -hmm. wanting to do that refresh. And I think that's part of the importance of always uh, what we're trying to do here is help folks remember and learn mm -hmm. about what others have done. Mm -hmm. And so they can carry it on mm -hmm. and um, bringing that forward. Is there anything that you would like to add more than what you've, you know, because I think this, there's a lot of history here and there's a lot of activity. Um, have you been able to cover off everything that you think you've wanted to cover off? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting a, a coaching thing here about the other thing that we did that must be mentioned. Okay, let's stop. Oh, We're going to start again. <laughs> oh, we have to mention this. That's okay. Right. Oh, yeah. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah, we seem to have forgotten that uh, Jeepa had a pretty good baseball team mm -hmm. back in the day. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, uh, I'll just mention that Michael Candler, who was instrumental in, in this conversion campaign work, as well as Jeepa, and who passed away sadly many years ago, way too soon. But Michael Candler was a good friend, and he was an American expat that uh, mm -hmm. lived on Gabriel, as mentioned. And... Um, so he's a baseball fan, and when, okay. when he uh, knew, or you know, when he kind of put together that we should have a baseball team, and so some of us were around the room were kind of what, like, why? And he's like, you know why? Because after every game, I want to hear people stand up and say, three cheers for Jeepa, three cheers for Jeepa, three cheers for Jeepa. <laughs> And we thought, that's a good idea. And so yes. we put together a little baseball team and did pretty good. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. Yes, so that's we, another thing you can do on Gabriola. That's right. And we, yeah, it wasn't always all seriousness. I mean, we did have fun. We did have fundraisers. We had uh, social gatherings. And sometimes we would go to the beach. And, of course, sometimes what would gather us... Uh, uh, around the beach with all our families would be something like the um, August 6th Hiroshima and mm -hmm. August 9th Nagasaki, where we would launch peace lanterns into the, into the bay. So we, you know, we did a lot of um, marking of uh, important dates around the world. And we would do something on, on Gabriola that would be part of a, also global um, actions around, uh, that other people were doing in other spots too. So we did, we did, we did have fun also, yeah, <laughs> right. and, and enjoyed each other's company in different ways. That was that was important. Mm -hmm. And I, and I too would like to also mention that um, some of the concepts of you know nonviolent resistance and and peaceful coexistence. Uh, and some of the ideas that were were really strongly um, being advocated during that time uh, would be extremely important to to bring again into the conversations around the global situation today, as you were mentioning, because we're again the nuclear weapons still exist. We never did get rid of them. We mm -hmm. still have a kind of cold war happening. It just takes a different kind of form, and um, and there's still some really serious and dangerous um, um, conflicts around the world that uh, that that. Des deserve our peaceful attention and resistance. 
Okay. Thank you. But an NCC did was just kind of raise uh, perspective or raise awareness about something, put something on the map, put CF meter on the map, put it, <clears throat> get it into our attention. And um, the fact or, you know, that we've kind of gotten complacent about it again is probably uh, <clears throat> not good. Um, and so I, I think, uh, you know, this is a good call to actually bring mm -hmm. some light on the subject again. I wouldn't mind just reading a little uh, um, tribute that Alan did do to the Nanaimo Peace Camp activists. Um, this is in the prologue to his, uh, his articles. And he says that a special tribute should go to the Nanus Peace Camp activists who first brought this issue to public attention and who have endured public ridicule, threats, the ravages of winter weather to maintain the peace camp as the most visible protest against the perpetuation of the nuclear arms race in our local waters. Alan was very real Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.